topic for today is plane waves and two-dimensional linear systems. So optics can be considered a subset of electromagnetics, which theoretically are described by Maxwell's equations. Now we're going to make some assumptions uh, because in general the solution, rigorous solution of Maxwell's equations is very challenging. And there are only a few special cases in which those equations can be solved exactly. So we're going to make some simplifying assumptions. One is that our fields are monochromatic. And for us, that will mean that the time dependence has the form e to the minus i omega t, where omega, which is the frequency in radians per second, is 2 pi times nu, which is the frequency in hertz, or cycles per second. And as we've discussed previously, this is the physics notation. We use i instead of j for the imaginary unit, and e to the minus i omega t for time dependence. Then we can represent a field, say, of the form uh, cosine kz minus omega t, a real field, which is a function of space and time, as the real part of e to the i kz e to the minus i omega t. And here, e to the i kz is a phasor function of position. It gives the phase of the field. In this case, the phase of the field is a function of position. And so with this uh, phasor type of notation, we can just generally forget about the, the time dependence, the e to the minus i omega t uh, factor, and just work with the phasor, e to the i kz. If we ever need the actual real space and time dependence of the field, we multiply the phasor by e to the mi minus i omega t, take the real part. So that's our first assumption. So we're assuming our field only oscillates at a single frequency. We're going to also assume that we have a fixed polarization so that if our electric field phasor is a vector function, E of x, y, and z, we're going to assume that that has the form of some constant vector, E0, times a scalar function, g of x, y, and z. So that allows us to work with a scalar field rather than a vector field. And in many optics problems, this is a reasonable approximation. Now, not in all, because polarization is important, can be very important in optics. So if we're in a looking at a problem where polarization is important and does change with position in space or time, uh, then we have to drop this, this uh, assumption here. But for most of the problems we'll look at, this is a good assumption. And then, if we assume that the electromagnetic properties of the media in question are all linear, Maxwell's equations become are, are linear, and so we'll end up with a two-dimensional linear system. In this sense, we're talking about a three-dimensional field, but we're going to think of it in the following terms. If this is the optical axis, the z-axis, and here's some plane, 
where z is equal to z1, and here is another plane where z is equal to z2, we'll think of the field in the plane z is equal to z1, whatever that is, as a two-dimensional function, g1 of x and y. Right? So obviously then g1 of x and y would just be our three-dimensional field, g of x, y, where z is equal to z1. And then over here at z is equal to z2, we'll have some other field we'll call g2 of x and y, a two-dimensional field. And of course then g2 of x and y will just be our three-dimensional field, g of x, y, and z, with z limited to z is equal to z2. And we will think of this second field further along down the optical axis as being a linear function or a transformation of the first two-dimensional function. So we'll think of the field in this plane as being some linear function, linear transformation of the field in the previous plane. And that will be our picture for most of the problems we'll be looking at. Now, when we talk about a linear system, we mean that it has the property of linearity, which for a two-dimensional system would mean um, that if we take a transformation of some two-dimensional function, say g1a of x and y, and we find that that is g2a of x and y, and we take a transformation of another function, call it g1b of x and y, and that produces g2b of x and y, then the transformation of an arbitrary linear combination of these two inputs, let's say big A, g1a, x and y, plus big B, uh, g1b of x and y, will be that same linear combination of the individual outputs. Big A, g, 2a of x and y, plus b, big B, g, 2b of x and y. And this is the principle of superposition. We can superimpose uh, individual input and output relationships, add them up, uh, and we get a new input and output relationship. In our analysis of two-dimensional linear systems, there are some useful functions that uh, we will make use of. And these are generally two-dimensional versions of one-dimensional functions you've probably already encountered in previous coursework. So one of those one-dimensional functions would be the rectangle or rect function. We will define this to be zero if the absolute value of x is greater than a half, one half if the absolute value of x is equal to one half, and one if the absolute value of x is less than one half. So if we plotted that, uh, it would look something like this. So here's minus a half and one half. This definition at absolute value of x is equal to one half is just for mathematical consistency. Of course, the, the value of a function at a single point really has very little bearing on any physical applications. But So basically, it's a function that is one if x is between minus a half and a half and zero if it's outside that interval. We can combine these together um, to represent rectangular regions in 
an xy plane. So g of x and y might be, for example, rect of x minus x0 over a times rect of y minus y0 over b. And for a shorthand version of that, we might just write it as a single two-dimensional rect function, rect of x minus x0 over a and y minus y0 over b. And what this would look like would be centered, it'd be a rectangle centered at x is equal to x0, y is equal to y0, and let me redraw that. Might look something like this. Um, the width in the x dimension is a, and the height in the y dimension is b. So we could use these to represent, of course, rectangular apertures, but also um, rectangular pixels. And of course, if a and b are equal, then it would be a square pixel, which is a very common type of structure we come across in, in optics. The circle function, or circ, of R will be similar to the rect function. It's going to be 0 if the magnitude of R is greater than 1, 1 half if the magnitude of R is equal to 1, and 1 if the magnitude of R is less than 1. And this applies for r being equal to the radial distance from the origin to a point x, y. So r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. If we were to plot it out in the x, y plane, it would give you, as the name implies, a circle centered on the origin with a radius of 1. Of course, then if we looked at a, a, a function like, say, the circ of r over a, well, we just change this radius to a. So this allows us to represent a circular aperture, for example, which are very common and very important in, in optical imaging systems and other kinds of systems. So that's the rect and the circ functions. Uh, Another very important function you know from your one-dimensional linear systems theory courses is the delta function, which we also call an impulse. And we can think of this as a limiting case of a rectangle. The limit as width a goes to 0 of 1 over a times the rect x over a. So this would look like a rectangle, a total width A, and a height 1 over A. So of course, it would have then an, an area of 1, 1 over A times A. And A would get smaller and smaller, so it would shrink narrower and narrower and taller and taller. And then we could define a two-dimensional delta function, delta of x and y, as a product of delta of x times delta of y. And what this would look like in the xy plane, right, following on from this idea, you could imagine it as the limiting case of a square pixel where the pixel, if uh, we were to write, say, for example, delta of x minus x0, y minus y0, it would be a pixel centered at x0 and y0 with dimensions a by a, which are both going to 0, but the height of this, imagine the height of this little 
pixel coming out of the board would be 1 over a squared. So that the total volume of that surface would be a squared times 1 over a squared would always be 1, uh, but the pixel would get smaller and smaller and brighter and brighter. So it would represent a single point in the plane with uh, infinite brightness. So kind of an idealization of a very small, very bright pixel. Now, because of our way we define this, obviously a single rectangle function in one dimension has unit area, and likewise, the integral of this in the xy plane will also be one. So the integral of delta of x minus x zero y minus y zero dx dy is equal to one. And that allows us to use the delta function to come up with this somewhat strange looking representation of a two-dimensional function. G of x and y can be written as the integral of delta of x minus psi, Greek letter psi, y minus Greek letter eta, g of psi and eta. Now that strange looking expression is representing the function in terms of itself, but we can think of that as representing sampling. That's sampling. So you can imagine over here um, variation where we would have this would be psi and eta, and we would have a little pixel centered at x and y. And then you imagine we've got this in this whole plane. We've got g of psi and eta. And we superimpose this little mask with this pixel on it and integrate the product of those two. Well, it's going to be non-zero only within that pixel. And since the area, total area under that pixel function is uh, 1, then what we're going to get is, as that gets smaller and smaller, we're just going to pull out the value of g of psi and eta at x and y, which is what this says. It just represents, therefore, the sampling of a two-dimensional function. So that can be very useful for us. And by the way, just as a shorthand, uh, when we just write an integral, say integral dx, that implies infinite limits of integration from minus infinity to infinity. So I don't have to keep writing minus infinity to infinity if we just write it with no limits. Assume that means from minus infinity to infinity. Let's now define the function h of x and y and psi and eta to be the response or the output of our linear system, the transformation of an impulse, delta of x minus psi, y minus eta. So if we imagine over here, this is uh, in the input plane we can think of as an impulse located at, uh, centered at x is equal to psi and y is equal to eta, then that produces an output, which is this function, which is a function, of course, of the output coordinates, but also of the input coordinates of the impulse in general. And we'll call that the impulse response. So in general, it's a four-dimensional function. It's a function of the two coordinates of the input impulse location and two coordinates of the in the output plane. And now we can use that um, interesting way that we went about representing a function as a as a, basically a sampling of itself to say that the output of a linear system g two of x and y is the transformation of the input g1 of x and y, but we write that 
g1 of x and y as a sampled version of itself. Delta of x minus psi, y minus eta, times g1 of psi and eta. And now the transformation operates on the x and y behavior of this, and that's the delta function. But we already said the transformation of the delta function is this thing we call the impulse response. So this result will be that the output will be h of x and y psi and eta times g1 psi and eta d psi d eta. And that is the general relationship between input and output for a two-dimensional linear system. So this just says, well, imagine going into the input and looking at each little pixel located at arbitrary coordinates psi and eta, and that particular pixel will produce an output, which will be that value of the input at that pixel, g1 of psi and eta, times this impulse response, h of x, y, psi, and eta. Now that uh, function is in general four-dimensional, meaning for every different pixel here in the input, we could get a completely different output function. They don't necessarily have to have any relationship among themselves. And that's a pretty difficult system to analyze, even though it is linear. Things are considerably simpler if we have the property of shift invariance. So if we have a shift invariant to the linear system, then the impulse response is only two-dimensional. And h of x, y, psi, and eta takes the form of just h of x minus psi, y minus eta. Conceptually, this means if we have an input at uh, x and y, centered at x and y is equal to zero, so we've just put a pixel, an impulse at the origin, then we get an output, which is some function h of x and y. And if we move this input pixel, we just take that same output function and move it correspondingly, move it to an arbitrary center, psi and eta. So we get exactly the same function, it just shifts with the shift of the input. That's why we call it a shift invariant system. So in that case, this relationship reduces to um, g2 of x and y is equal to the integral h of x minus psi y minus eta times g1 of psi and eta d psi d eta. And we call that a two-dimensional 2D convolution. And we represent it as g2 of x and y is h of x and y convolved, we use a star to represent convolution, convolved with g1 of x and y. So this notation just means take these two functions and put it in to this integral and calculate that. So for a shift invariant system, we have a convolution between an input and an impulse response. So in optical systems, typically a shift invariant system would be a system in which this, the system looks the same if you shift your perspective. You move in the input plane, the system looks the same. So free space has that property. Generally, though, a system that has lenses will not have that property. So free space will have this kind of a shift invariant relationship between input and output. But in general, an optical system with lenses will not. It'll have this more 
more um, difficult four-dimensional type of input-output relationship with an, an arbitrary four-dimensional impulse response. Now, however, we will be able to often manipulate this so that we can break up the truly four-dimensional part into maybe a factor that we can pull out from this integral and then still use this idea of a convolution. Now imagine we take as an input g1 of x and y to be equal to e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy. And we've already talked about how using the phasor concept we might end up with these complex exponentials in describing real fields. And for now though, though, just imagine this is just some mathematical input where here u and v are for now constants. Well, if it's a shift invariant linear system, then the output g2 of x and y will be the convolution or the integral of h x minus psi y minus eta times this input evaluated at psi and eta e to the i2 pi u psi plus v eta d psi d eta. And now let's write that as we're going to put a factor of e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy out in front. And then we'll have the integral of h of x minus psi y minus eta e and then we're going to write this factor as e to the minus i 2 pi u and now to counteract this term we put out in front we're going to put an x here so that'll be e to the minus i 2 pi ux times e to the plus i 2 pi ux those will cancel out and then the psi term here will be minus minus psi. And we'll do the same thing for v, y, and eta. Okay, so we just kind of rewritten this, this term as a product of these two terms here where this cancels out with the x and y dependence there and the minus minus becomes a plus psi and eta. And now we look at this and everywhere x appears, it appears as x minus psi. Let's call that a new variable alpha and y appears in the form y minus eta. Let's call that beta. And of course, uh, d psi um, and d eta would be minus d alpha minus d beta but minus minus is plus so this would be d alpha d beta and so we can then write this as e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy the integral of h of alpha and beta e to the minus i 2 pi u alpha plus v beta the alpha the beta and that integral we're going to define to be big H of u and V we integrate out the alpha and the beta dependence and we call that the transfer function of the two-dimensional shift invariant system Now, this operation, taking a function of x and y uh, and multiplying it by a complex exponential and integrating over all space, is a very useful concept. We're going to actually call that the Fourier transform. And so we're going to write that, in general, for a function g of 
x and y, we'll define g of u and v to be the integral, and uh, we can use x and y for the integration variables here. So I'll write g of x and y, e to the minus i, 2 pi, ux plus vy, dx, dy. And that is going to be called the two-dimensional Fourier transform. Well, it's another two-dimensional function, g of u and v, big G of u and v, is this Fourier transform g of x and y. And going the other way, we can write g of x and y as a similar transformation, big G of u and v times e to the plus i, 2 pi ux plus vy, the u dv. And this would be called the 2d inverse Fourier transform. And it's a generalization of the one-dimensional Fourier transforms that you've already studied in other coursework. What's very interesting about this expression is if, as we will shortly, interpret this factor as the x and y dependence of a plane wave, well then this represents an arbitrary two-dimensional function, a slice of the three-dimensional field, and some plane z is equal to a constant, as a superposition of plane waves. That'll be extremely important for us going forward. Now let's write a 2D function g1 of x and y as an inverse Fourier transform of big G1 of u and v, which, by the way, we call the spectrum of g1. So later we'll call it the angular spectrum, and we'll see why. g1 of u and v times e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy du dv. And now let's put g1 through a linear system, a shift invariant linear system that has an impulse response h of x and y. And we'll call this g2 of x and y, our output. And that will be, well, we could do a convolution directly with g1, but another way to look at it is a transformation of this integral here. Well, the x and y dependence is in this complex exponential factor, and we already figured out what the linear transformation of that was for a shift invariant linear system. It was this factor times what we call the transfer function. All right, so this will be equal to the integral of g1 u and v times the linear transformation of this complex exponential. integrated du and dv, and that will be equal to, well, that is just that complex exponential times the transfer function, h of u and v, let's put the h and u and v out here in front, and then the g1 of u and v, and then that complex exponential, e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy, and everything integrated du dv. Now, of course, g2 of x and y can also be represented by an inverse Fourier transform. So we could write that g2 of x and y would be equal to the integral of g2 of u and v, e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy du dv. And the equality of these two integrals tells us that it must be the case that g2 of u and v is equal to our transfer function h of u and v times g1 of u and v. In other words, the spectrum of the output is the spectrum of the input times the transfer function. So now we have two ways to understand the behavior of a shift invariant two-dimensional linear system.
we can represent the output g2 of x and y as the convolution of the impulse response with the input g1 of x and y or since g2 of x and y is the inverse Fourier transform of a big g2 of u and v we can understand it as the inverse Fourier transform of the product of the transfer function and the spectrum of the input. So there's two different ways to understand a shift invariant linear system. And we will use both of these ways to understand the diffraction of an arbitrary field in free space, what we'll call the diffraction, which just means the effect on propagation a certain distance along the optical axis of an arbitrary field. Let's consider a two-dimensional function, which is just a delta function at a, a pixel at the origin, delta of x and y. And let's calculate the Fourier transform of that. So that would be g, u, and v is equal to the integral of delta of x and y times e to the minus i 2 pi ux plus vy dx dy. But all right, what does the delta function do? It just samples the integrand, the rest of the integrand, at the points at which its two arguments are equal to zero. So that would, in this case, just be x is equal to zero, y is equal to zero. So that's just this exponential. At x is equal to y is equal to zero, that's e to the zero is equal to one. The Fourier transform of a delta function is one. Well, now let's write the inverse Fourier transform of that relationship. That would mean that delta of x and y could be represented as one times e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy du dv. And so we have an interesting representation of the delta function. This will, in terms of the, the physics of this, this will represent a superposition of all possible plane waves. If we want to offset our delta function, to shift it to be centered at psi eta, we have delta of x minus psi y minus eta. Well, that'll simply be the same integral with the same shift. e to the i 2 pi u x minus psi plus v y minus eta du dv. Now, we show in more detail in the notes, but I'm just going to write the result down here. An interesting relationship between a two-dimensional function and its Fourier transform. And that is that the integral over all space of the magnitude of g of x and y squared dx dy is equal to the integral of the magnitude of big G of u and v magnitude squared du dv. And this is called Parseval's theorem. When we apply this concept to a physical field, we'll see that this ends up being just a statement of the conservation of energy. Again, the more details are given in the PDF notes. You've probably seen this, at least for one-dimensional functions, in your undergraduate work already, so we won't repeat the derivation. Another result that is a two-dimensional generalization of the one-dimensional results that you've already seen in previous coursework is the shift theorem. And this says that the Fourier transform of function g of x and y that has been shifted, so it becomes g of x minus a, y minus b, is equal to an exponential function, e to the minus i, 2 pi, ua plus vb, 
times the spectrum g of u and v. So when you shift the spatial function, the spectrum gets multiplied by a complex exponential. If you then take the spectrum and you shift that by some amount, say g of u minus alpha, v minus beta, the result in the spatial domain is the complex exponential e to the i, 2 pi alpha x plus beta y times the original function g of x and y. So in general, if in one domain, either space or what we call frequency domain, or spectral domain, if we shift in one domain, in the other domain, we get multiplication by a complex exponential. And taking the inverse Fourier transform of this first relationship, of course, we would also then have that the inverse Fourier transform of this complex exponential, e to the minus i 2 pi ua plus vb times the spectrum g of u and v will produce a shifted version of g of x and y. It'll be g of x minus a and y minus b. In taking a Fourier transform of the second relationship, we have that the Fourier transform of e to the i 2 pi alpha x plus beta y times g of x and y will be equal to the spectrum g of u and v with a shift, g of u minus alpha, v minus beta. And later we'll see what the physical significance of these are. These factors, these exponential factors, we'll think of as the x and y dependence, say, of a plane wave. And we'll see that this just means that if we multiply uh, a function of position by a plane wave or illuminate, for example, a transparency with this transmittance function by a particular plane wave, the output will be shifted in what we'll call the far field diffraction zone. Okay, so this will all have physical significance, and that is the shift theorem. Another important theorem for Fourier transforms is the scaling theorem. And this says, and again, we won't go through the details. This is a two-dimensional generalization of one-dimensional results you've probably already seen, and some details are given in the notes. Uh, the Fourier transform of a function g of x and y, where we scale the arguments, say, in the x dimension by a, so we have g of x over a, and in the y dimension by b, so we've got the Fourier transform of g of x over a, y over b, is equal to the absolute value of a times b, which allows for a, either a or b or both to be negative, times the spectrum g evaluated at a u b v. And we also have the result that the inverse Fourier transform of g of a u b v of course, just from this above result, will be equal to 1 over the absolute value of a times b times g of x over a y over b. So the important physical implication of this, as we'll see in diffraction, what this means, if, for example, say a and b are, are both bigger than 1, then this would be, essentially, you'd be shrinking your input, scaling it down, then in this domain, which we'll see as the far field diffraction domain, you'll be scaling things up. So if you shrink in one domain, you scale up or magnify in the other domain, and vice versa. Another important result we need, um, because we'll see that Fourier transforms play a central role in the theory of diffraction, of propagation of fields in free space. 
we will need the Fourier transform of the rectangle function. And let's just look at the one-dimensional case. Fourier transform of rect of x. Well, that'll be the integral over all x values of rect of x e to the minus i 2 pi ux dx. Of course, the rect is 1 between minus 1 half and a half. So this will be the integral from minus a half to a half of e to the minus i 2 pi ux dx, which will be equal to, uh, so the antiderivative here would be e to the minus i 2 pi ux. We're integrating with respect to x, so for the chain rule, we would need a factor of minus i 2 pi u in the denominator, and then we're evaluating between minus a half and a half. So that is equal to e to the i pi u minus e to the minus i pi u over 2i times pi u. Uh, let's see, I messed that up. That's minus a half to a half, sorry. So let's see, when we put a one half in here, we get e to the, well, the one half for x will cancel out this two. So we get e to the minus i pi u. That's this guy over here. And then we're taking this minus sign and associating it with that exponential. And then we'll get minus the result at minus a half. The minus a half, well, the minus will cancel that minus, and the two will cancel, the half will cancel that two. So we'll get e to the plus i pi u, and that's this term there. And then we'll be left, because we've already taken the minus sign out here, we'll be left with 2i pi u. And so what is that? Well, e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta over 2i is the sine of theta. So this will be equal to the sine of the theta, which is pi u, over pi u. And that function is so important that we define it, give it its own name, we call it the sink of u. So sink of u is sine pi u over pi u. And, and that's pronounced sink. That is the sink function. And of course, if we did a two-dimensional Fourier transform of a product of recs, we would get a product of sinks. So, the sink function looks something like this. Um, so this is sink of x is sine pi x over pi x. So let's see. Now that's a little tricky. At x is equal to 0 because you have a 0 over 0 form. But as x goes to 0, the sine of a small number is approximately equal to the small number. So this becomes just pi x over pi x. So we see that sink of 0 will be equal to 1. So this will be 1 right there. And um, of course, every time the argument of the sine is an integer multiple pi, you'll have a 0. So this would be x is equal to 1. This would be x is equal to 2. This is x is equal to minus 1 and minus 2, etc. This is 0. So it's equal to 1 at 0, and then 0 at all non-zero integers. And then you get this these bumps here, this main bump we'll call the main lobe, and these other bumps we'll call side lobes. This is a side lobe. So that's what the sink looks like, and the amplitudes of these side lobes you can figure out. For example, at 1.5, you just put in your sine pi times 1.5 over pi times 1.5. And these get smaller and smaller as x gets bigger because of this pi x in the denominator. This is an even function because sine is odd and this denominator is odd and the ratio of two odd functions is even. Now, we know that uh, the sink is the Fourier transform of the rect and therefore 
the inverse Fourier transform of the sink, here we do that, of the sink, must be the rect. And if we let x be equal to 0, well, the rect at 0 is equal to 1. So we get that 1 is equal to the integral of the sink of u. And this is e to the 0 is 1 du. So the area under the sink is equal to 1. And you can also show that the integral of the sink squared is equal to 1. So we will say then, and if you kind of compare this to a rect, which has a value of 1 between x is equal to 1 half and minus 1 half, and that has unit area, well, so it makes sense to say that rect x has a total width of 1, because it literally does. Uh, but the sink also has unit area, and it's kind of concentrated in this main lobe. So we'll also say that about the sink function, that it has a width of 1. And because the sink squared also has unit area, we'll also say that about the sink squared. So these three functions, rec, sink, and sink squared, will say that they have a width or an effective width of one. In the case of the rec, it's exactly the width. Sink and sink squared never actually become uniformly zero, uh, but effectively they have a width of one also. With regards to the two-dimensional Fourier transform, instead of using rectangular coordinates, we can use polar coordinates. We can write x is equal to r cosine theta, y is equal to r sine theta, and in the for the spectral domain, we can write u is equal to rho cosine phi, v is equal to rho sine phi. And then in our complex exponential, where we have ux plus vy, well, that would become r rho cosine theta cosine phi from this product, and then for the other product, plus sine theta sine phi. And using a trig identity, that can be written as r rho cosine of theta minus phi. Therefore, g of rho and phi can be written as, well, we're going to integrate over the entire xy plane, and now we're going to be doing it in terms of these polar coordinates. So that'll be integral from 0 to 2 pi in the angle theta, and integral 0 to infinity in the radial distance r. We'll represent our field g of x and y now as g of r and theta, and our e to the minus i 2 pi ux plus vy becomes e to the minus i 2 pi r rho cosine of theta minus phi r dr d theta. Now this is of particular interest, um, and really only of interest, because this is a more complicated set of integrals to do generally than the ones in the rectangular coordinates. But if we have a field which has circular symmetry, where g of x and y now is simply a function, say, of g of r, uh, it's, it's independent of the, the angle theta. So this field has circular symmetry about the origin. Well, in that case, this reduces to, well, let's swap the order of integration. I put the r integral first, integral from 0 to infinity. g of r, that no longer depends on theta. So we'll move everything else over and 
put that inside the theta integral here, zero from two pi, uh, integral from zero to two pi, e to the minus i, two pi, r rho, cosine theta minus phi, um, and then we've got the d theta here, and then finally for the r integral, we've got r dr. Okay, now this integral here, it's going to be independent of the angle phi. And of course, the dependence on the angle theta will integrate out. Independent of the angle phi because um, the angle phi, all it does is just shift this cosine along the theta axis. But we're integrating over a full period. So the integral over a full period isn't going to depend on where we start and end that period as long as we take one whole period. So this will be independent of phi. And in fact, this integral can be evaluated to give. We won't do that. It involves the theory of Bessel functions, but it ends up being 2 pi times j0 of 2 pi r rho, where j0 is a Bessel function of the first kind of order 0. And with that, we then get what's called the Fourier Bessel Oops, Fourier Bessel transform. This is the form of the Fourier transform in the case where the function has circular symmetry. So the spectrum will also have circular symmetry. G of rho will be equal to 2 pi times the integral from 0 to infinity. G of r, j0 of 2 pi r rho r dr and the inverse transform will look like g of r will be 2 pi the integral from 0 to infinity g of rho j0 of 2 pi r rho rho d rho interesting result for this is that if little g of r is real well the j0 is real there's no uh, imaginary terms here anywhere, and so big G of rho will also be real. Well, that's the Fourier Bessel transform. A very important function for us because it will represent what we'll call a Gaussian beam will be the function G of x and y is equal to e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over a squared, which, using polar coordinates, could be represented as e to the minus pi r over a squared, where r squared is x squared plus y squared. So this is a function, obviously, with circular symmetry. If we look at a cross-section for, say, uh, for y is equal to zero, so we look at on the x-axis here, it would be a bell curve, a Gaussian. And at a distance of a from the origin, so at x is equal to plus or minus a, this would decrease down to, well, x is equal to a, y is equal to zero, so this would just be e to the minus pi which is equal to 0 0.0432 uh, and et cetera. So essentially almost all of the, the field is contained within a radius of A of the origin. Now, an important integral, special integral that can be evaluated is integral over all x of e to the minus pi x squared dx is equal to one. And as we show in the notes, we can evaluate explicitly um, the one-dimensional Fourier transform integral of e to the minus pi x squared, e to the minus i 2 pi ux dx, and that is e to the minus pi u squared. We get this very nice result 
that the Fourier transform of this Gaussian function is another Gaussian function. Okay, so good thing to remember, e to the minus pi x squared Fourier transforms to e to the minus pi u squared. And then we can use the scaling theorem so that if we have a beam with an arbitrary radius a, g of x and y is e to the minus pi x squared plus y squared over a squared, g of u and v, uh, it will just be the product of the x and y Fourier transforms, and then we'll use the scaling theorem. So that'll be equal to a squared times e to the minus pi a squared, u squared, plus v squared. So that'll be very important because we'll see that the Gaussian beam, first of all, uh, at least approximately, lasers produce Gaussian beams, so they have practical importance. And then also, we'll be able to solve the problem of diffraction of a Gaussian beam exactly for an arbitrary distance. It's one of the few fields that we can do that for. And so that'll be a very important test case we'll have uh, in order to, to look at the phenomenon of diffraction. Now let's talk about plane waves. If we have a field that is oscillating at a single frequency uh, in radians per second is omega, which is 2 pi times a hertz frequency, nu, then our field will satisfy Maxwell's equations, a scalar field, if that solves the so-called Helmholtz equation. The Helmholtz equation is Laplacian of g plus k squared g is equal to zero. For k squared, is omega squared mu epsilon, which is equal to 2 pi over lambda squared. Or mu is called the permeability of the medium. Epsilon is the permittivity. And lambda is the wavelength. The Laplacian there is the sum of the second derivatives in x, y, and z. And so it follows that g of x, y, and z is equal to e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy plus wz is a solution of the Helmholtz equation if, well, if you do a second derivative with respect to x here, you'd bring down two factors of i 2 pi u, so that squared, which would become i squared is minus 1, then you have 2 pi squared, and then you would have u squared. And then you get the, likewise for i2 pi v, so you get plus a v squared, and w. So you get that thing times g, and then you have here plus k squared times g, so plus k squared times g is equal to zero. Uh, and that's going to be zero if this factor out in front is equal to zero. And since we can write k squared is a 2 pi over a lambda squared, we can cancel a common factor of 2 pi squared. What we have is then the condition for this to be a solution is that 1 over lambda squared is u squared plus v squared plus w squared. So if the u, v, and w terms, the sum of their squares is 1 over the wavelength squared, then this is a solution of the Helmholtz equation, which means that the whole field is a solution of Maxwell's equations. And if we define a, what we call the propagation vector, k, to be 2 pi times 
a vector with x, y, and z coordinates, u, v, and w. And we define the position vector to be a vector with x, y, and z coordinates, x, y, and z. Then this solution has the form g of x, y, and z is e to the i k dot r. Right? And if we combine that with e to the i k dot r with the time dependence of minus i omega t and take the real part of that using the phasor concept, we would get cosine k dot r minus omega t would be the real electric field dependence on space and time. So our factor e to the i k dot r, uh, where k dot r is now the inner product of those two vectors will be 2 pi times ux plus vy plus wz. And if you set those equal to a constant, well, that's just the equation of a plane. Well, our linear function of x, y, and z is equal to a constant is the equation of a plane. Um, if we take our k, which is propagation vector, 2 pi u v w, and uh, let's take the special case where there's no v term, v is equal to 0, so you just got u and w, and we know the magnitude of k is 2 pi over lambda, so then the vector u0 v, uh, u0 w would be a unit vector, and we'll write that as sine of theta 0 cosine of theta, then e to the i 2 pi ux plus v, which is 0 times y plus wz, will be e to the i 2 pi over lambda x sine theta plus z cosine theta. And what does that look like? So this is in the xz plane. Right. So here we'll end up with phase fronts, which are linear functions of x and z. So they're lines in the xz plane. They will be perpendicular to the propagation vector k. And we see that if we go along the x-axis here, the, the x-axis or the z-axis, the distance we have to travel for the phase to change by 2 pi would be, well, x sine theta would have to increase by lambda. Or if we look at this form, x would have to increase by 1 over u. And therefore, distance between these lines that have the same phase, let's say, let's take the phase is equal to zero, that would be a distance of 1 over u, and on the z-axis, the corresponding distance would be 1 over w. The distance between these lines of, say, zero phase uh, in the direction of k, well, that would be a distance of lambda. And so what we see here uh, equating u to sine theta over lambda, um, we have that 1 over u is lambda over sine theta. So this distance here is also the wavelength over sine of theta, right, where this is, this is the angle theta. And 1 over w, Okay, we would equate that to lambda over cosine of theta. So we see that the, the parameters u and w are intimately related with the angle of propagation. And of course, we can directly see that u is sine theta over lambda here. And 
w is equal to the cosine theta over lambda. Now more generally, you could represent the propagation vector k uh, such that it has non-zero u, v, and w components, and we could write that using spherical coordinates as 2 pi u, v, w is equal to 2 pi over lambda times a unit vector of the form sine theta cosine phi, sine theta sine phi, and cosine theta. And in that case, u here would be equal to sine theta cosine phi over lambda. V would be equal to the sine theta sine phi over lambda. And W would be equal to the cosine of theta over lambda. So we see that in general, these parameters U, V, and W that come into play in the exponent of the complex representation of a plane wave are intimately related to angles of propagation. Right? And in this, in this point of view, this would be the z direction, here would be x, and here would be y, and this would be our propagation vector, k, which if we projected that back into the xy plane, uh, this would be the angle theta with respect to the z-axis, and this angle between that projection and the x-axis would be the angle phi. And so the u, v, and w parameters in our plane wave really are just ways to parameterize these angles theta and phi. So now, if we take a two-dimensional function g of x and y and represent it as an inverse two-dimensional Fourier transform, a spectrum g of u and v times e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy du dx, well, this we can interpret as the x and y dependence of a plane wave. And we've seen that uh, the u and v are determined by the angles of propagation of the plane wave. And so we'll call this spectrum the angular spectrum. It will tell us what the amplitude of a particular plane wave component that comprises this field here is at the angles that correspond to these, what we call spatial frequencies, u and v. Now, in general, for a plane wave solution, we saw that 1 over lambda squared is equal to u squared plus v squared plus w squared. So if we have the u and v values fixed by this term here, the w value can be determined by just solving this equation for w, and it could be plus or minus the square root of move everything else over to the other side. We'll take the positive square root. We'll talk about this later. So it'll be, w will be square root of one over lambda squared minus u squared plus v squared. And let's factor out the one over lambda squared and take the square root of that, that'd be one over lambda. That would leave behind one minus lambda squared u squared plus v squared. Now, from what we had on the previous board, we know that lambda squared u squared or lambda squared v squared can be expressed in terms of those angles theta and phi. So each of them will have a factor of sine of theta, so that'll be squared, sine squared of theta. And then the u had a uh, cosine phi, and the v had a sine phi, and of course, cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one, so this will be equal to the sine squared of theta. So this guy here will be sine squared of theta. Now, if we're in the paraxial approximation, right, the theta is the angle between the 
the propagation vector and the optical axis, the z-axis. We said that's generally small. So sine squared of theta will be much less than 1. In the paraxial approximation. And so up in this expression here, we can use the Taylor series 1 minus x is it to first order in x equal to 1 minus 1 half x, then plus higher order terms. So using that here to solve for w, that would be 1 over lambda, and then using this for this, the square root expression, that would be 1 minus lambda squared over 2 u squared plus v squared. And multiplying out the 1 over lambda, we could get then 1 over lambda minus lambda over 2 u squared plus v squared. And so in that paraxial approximation, our plane wave e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy plus wz would be, well, here's our w, so it'll give you a factor e to the i 2 pi 1 over lambda times z. We'll pull that out in front. And then we've got the x and y dependence. We'll put that here. e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy. And then the remainder of the z dependence will be this term here. So see, we'll have i2 pi times minus lambda over 2. The 2s will cancel. We'll get a minus sign. So e to the minus i um, pi lambda u squared plus v squared. And that is our expression for a plane wave. and the paraxial approximation.